The topic of this talk will be the status of red drum populations in Georgia in the year 2021. This is the outline for the presentation. First, we'll start with introduction and we'll talk about fishery background. We'll move on to surveys and data sources. Then we'll talk about sampling data and results. We'll move on to discussion and we'll talk about some conclusions with future activities. So here's some background information that you may or may not already know. Red drum are the state saltwater fish of Georgia. They are the most popular saltwater game fish in the state. They have a complex life history where young fish live in marshes Mature fish move offshore as they get larger, and then adults return to the marshes to spawn. For a long lived up to 50 years, they were heavily fished up through the 1980s, at which point stronger fishing regulations were enacted. Despite these regulations, recent management questions have come up regarding the status of red drum populations within the state. Here's an overview of red drum regulations in Georgia. The first directed regulation went into effect in 1986. Since then, regulations have become more restrictive based on size and daily creels. Currently, you're operating under a year-round season with 14 to 23 inch slot, five fish daily creel, and a five fish possession limit that went to effect in 2002. Regional stock assessments are performed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. The goal of these assessments is to determine the status of red drum throughout the Atlantic coast. The 2009 assessment from South Carolina to Florida determined that overfishing was not occurring, but could not determine if the population was overfished. Recruitment was observed to be stable, and the spawning potential ratio, which is the ratio of possible spawning capacity in the population and the fish state over that of the unfish state, was estimated to be 49.5, which is above the 30% management threshold. The 2017 assessment, overfishing once again, was not occurring, but it could not determine if the population was overfish. Recruitment again was asserted to be stable. The spawning potential ratio this time was 53.5, which is also <clears throat> above the 30% management threshold and the 40% target. Georgia data was used in both of these assessments. So now we'll talk about the CRD surveys and some of our data sources. We collect information through the Marine Recreational Information Program, or better known as MRIP. So NOAA Fisheries Program that develops, improves, and implements a national network of surveys to measure how many fish anglers catch and how many trips they take. This is a state, regional, federal partnership of which we participate in. We coordinate survey operations and on-site data collections, which are a recreational angler surveys. We participate in quality assurance and quality control procedures. It is used by many organizations for fisheries assessments and managements. We're used in conjunction with our in-house CRD surveys for management. Now we're going to talk about our CRD in-house sampling surveys and programs. Our surveys are designed to sample across red drum life stages. First, the Marine Sport Fish Population Health Survey samples smaller red drum in Georgia estuaries. And the Coastal Longline Survey encounters large adult red drum offshore and state waters. We have the Marine Sport Fish Carcass Recovery Program, which samples legal sized fish derived from the recreational fishery within the state. The Cooperative Angler Tagging Program samples red drum of various sizes with the help of anglers they can provide information within and outside of the state. And finally, we have the escapement project, which targets over older juveniles in the Georgia estuaries, but tags can be detected outside of the state as fish age and immigrate from coastal waters. Marine Sport Fish Population Health Survey is a net survey that occurs in three different zones in Georgia, also Altamaha and St. Andrew. It's been ongoing since 2003, but St. Andrew Sound was added in 2019. The first component is a gill net survey, which is used as an index of abundance for juvenile red drum. It's conducted from June to August each year, and it uses a single panel 300 foot long by 9 foot deep gill net with two and a half inch structure mass. 108 net sets per sound are set annually, and the sites are selected randomly from a number of predetermined stations in each sound. The tremble net survey is an index of abundance for spotted sea trout, but also provides index indices for other fin fish species, including red drum. It's conducted from September to November, 150 net sets per sound are set annually. This uses a 300 foot long by 7 foot deep trammel net with two 14 inch stretch mesh outer panels and a 2.75 inch stretch mesh inner panel. Coastal longline survey is used to develop indices of abundance for adult red drum and sharks. Sampling is performed on the RV Marguerite and it uses a half mile long line with 60 hooks. Nearshore and offshore areas of Georgia are sampled from Doughboy Sound to St. Mary's River. 
Sampling occurs from June to December in four six-week quarters. During the season, sampling efforts proportionally allow, allocated to match the immigration pattern of adult red drum near shore. The Marine Sport Fish Carcass Recovery Project is an angler-driven project. Anglers donate filleted fish carcasses to us, and we use the biological data from those carcasses to supplement data from other surveys. Freezers are located throughout coastal Georgia where donations can be made. Since 1997, CRD has processed more than 79,000 carcasses for length, sex, and age data via odorless. You see a picture here. This is a partnership between CRD, participating marinas, the Georgia Natural Resources Foundation, and the Georgia Power Foundation. The tagging and escapement projects are two different projects that provide similar information through different means. Tagging fish provides information on life rates, such as growth and mortality, and also information about things such as movement. Here, we're using them to address questions about holes in our red drum knowledge. This includes fishing mortality, movements out of the sounds at late juvenile stages, and habitat use within sounds or offshore areas. The first project uses conventional tags, and this is the Cooperative Angler Tagging Program. The conventional tags are the plastic dart tags you might be familiar with. The program has been ongoing since 1988, although effort has varied over time during this period. For this project, we give anglers external tags that they implant in fish, then anglers can return these tags for rewards and give us the information about the fish. The only true tags, on the other hand, are electrically powered tags. And they were used by the escapement project. These are implanted internally. We use passive receivers that are deployed across the state and into different areas to detect these tags as the fish swim by. Both types of data can be used together to inform management. As I mentioned before, the Cooperative Angler Tagging Program has been ongoing since 1988. Although in 2020, we added some enhancements. The existing program provided information, but it was lacking. Historically, it had been more PR focused, and there had been a lack of consistent information about return rates. There had also been a lack of information about retention. And these are important for doing estimates of things such as mortality and modeling. So to counter this, we added high reward tags to learn about return rates. We used a $100 reward, which had been used before. A subset of these tags are deployed by our CRD personnel. And these are the pink tags that you may or may not be familiar with. Additionally, we had double tags to learn about retention of tags in fish. We used staff tagging to fill in spatial and size gaps. And as part of all of this, we made a greater outreach effort to alert the public about tags and the tagging program as a whole. The Skidman project uses acoustic telemetry tags, such as those pictured in the lower right. So battery powered tags that emit an acoustic signal that can be detected by receivers. These receivers are placed in arrays and they sit 24 seven listening for fish with these tags that pass by. A lot of times the receivers place the gates and inlets and sounds to determine if fish are passing, you know, either in or out. Right now we have arrays in Wausau and St. Simon's Sound and there are also the Georgia Coastal Array that extends offshore in the state. There are also arrays in other states that are made up of these same receivers that can detect our tags if they move out of the area. Tags are surgically implanted into red drum. We focus our effort in fish approaching and in the slot. The tags have a lifespan of five to six years. Um, tag fish will also get an external tag to alert anglers that you know this fish have you know tags in it. And surgically implanting the tags allows for better retention of the tag over time. Now we'll move on to data and results. So this is a graph of MRIP estimated catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort over time in Georgia. A catch here is the number of fish that are caught total by anglers, while harvest is a portion of those fish that are caught that are kept and harvested by anglers. So you can see catch per unit in the black line and harvest per unit effort in the dashed line. The vertical dashed lines are years of regulation changes in Georgia. And as you can see, over time, catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort are fairly steady, although there is a lot of variation in the numbers from year to year. This graph is similar to the last one, although it shows catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort split by region in Georgia. We have northern region, which is Savannah, uh, south to about Altamaha, and the southern region, which is Altamaha, um, St. Simons, and to the Florida line. So what you can see here is there's not a big difference in CPUE 
across the different areas. Um, there's also not a big difference in harvest per unit effort either. Now, over time, the trend is fairly stable, although you do see, of course, a dip here in 2020. This graph shows estimated harvest length over time. And it's broken into two time periods, 1993 to 2001, when there was a 14 to 27 inch slot, and 2002 to 2021, where we had a 14 to 23 inch slot. What's interesting here is that for both cases, the majority of fish that were harvested were in the lower half of the slot. Not nearly as many larger fish were harvested during this, these time periods. Similarly here, looking at our carcass length data from 2002 to 2021, there's a similar pattern seen in MRIP, where fish harvested primarily fall in the lower half of the slot. Our carcass survey also shows variation in the length and age of fish caught over time. Generally, the smallest fish and the youngest fish are caught in September, whereas larger fish are caught in late summer. And this is, can be explained by just the growth pattern and the spawning cycle of red drum, where fish that are, the small fish that are emerging to be legal in the slot are emerging in the late summer, early fall period. And then throughout the year as they age, they obviously get bigger and older. These are the results from our Georgia gillnet survey. You've probably seen these before because these have been presented at other fisheries advisory panels meetings. And here are the Georgia total catch per unit effort is represented by the bars, where individually Wausau Sound and Altamaha Sound are represented by the lines. We do not have an estimate or an index yet set up for St. Andrew Sound because it's so new. But as you can see over time, there's variation in the indices, although they tend to sync up pretty well. And then in the last couple of years, especially 2020, you do see a strong decline in both surveys. The gillnet survey is designed to provide an index of juvenile red drum as they enter the slot. And as you can see from the size distribution, it's doing just that. Primary fish that are caught in the survey range from 9 to 14 inches. The travel net survey is not used directly for red drum management, but it can provide additional information from on top of the gillnet survey. One of the things you notice here is that in this survey, the Altamaha and the Wausau don't necessarily line up very well. The Tremonet survey tends to catch different sizes of red drum. Part of this is just because it takes place later in the year, but it also, the year is more effective at catching some of the larger red drum in the mid 20 plus size class. One thing to notice though, is that during the same time period, the trammel net survey has only caught about a third of the number of red drum that the gillnet survey has caught. Now moving on to the cooperative angler tagging program. From 2017 to present, 5,515 tags were released with 832 total returns. Of those returns, 95% were inside the state, and the 3% came from Florida and 1% from South Carolina. Average days at large for tags were almost 153 days, and mean growth was 0.4 millimeters a day. Now for double tags, we released 156. We had 16 returns, all with both tags. There were 100% retention of these tags also in a two week study that we did. Now for our high reward tags, 44 tags were released and 11 returns. Using the information from the high reward tags and the regular tags we put out, we've estimated that we have about a 70% estimated reporting rate, which is really high for a lot of tagging studies. This is the table that shows our cooperative tag deployments from 2020 to 2021. Now these are tags that are put out both by our cooperative taglers and our staff taggers. We got right at 1,800 tags out total. Uh, what's not listed here are the 44 high reward tags that were deployed by the staff taggers. And the one important thing to note from looking at this is that between the taggers and the co-op, both sets of taggers, we were able to increase our geographic distribution of tags throughout the state. This is a graph of the length of fish tagged from 2020 to 2021. The important thing here is that by adding staff taggers, we were able to increase the size distribution of fish tag. Those cooperative anglers tend to tag larger, larger fish, and we were able to tag smaller fish. This is a chart that shows the fate of tagged fish that were recaptured since 2019. Of the recaptured fish, 30 were harvested, 30% were harvested. 24% were 
released, although they were legal slot size, the 46% of those captured were released, but they were illegal in slot size. Now of those fish, 7% were undersized, and 39% were oversized. This graph shows our estimates of fishing mortality over time based on our tagging data. These are preliminary, but overall, they, the estimates are pretty low. These are similar to the fishing mortality estimates that were noted in the 2017 stock assessment. And our estimates will improve over time as more tags are returned and we have more data. And we also need to examine other models to possibly improve estimates. This graph shows our long line survey catch per unit effort. And as you can see, generally over time, the trend has been pretty stable, although actually in the more recent years, we have had some, some higher CPUEs. Uh, it is worth noting that only two dredge were caught in 2020, but that was due to vessel issues that restricted our sampling, so we weren't able to get out nearly as much as we needed to. This graph shows the mean size and range of sizes of red drum caught in our long lane survey annually. And as you can see, this survey definitely does a good job of catching adult red drum that are much larger than those captured in the gill net and the trammel net surveys. Here's some early results from our escapement study. At this time, a total of 50 red drum have been tagged in Wausau Sound. The fish range in size from 13 and a half to 29 and a half inches forkling. At least 25 have been detected by the array at the most recent receiver check. None of our fish have been detected outside the state and other arrays. And two of our fish were harvested by anglers shortly after their release. One fish was caught and released offshore in South Carolina. It had been at large for 459 days. It was 28 inches long at capture and had grown an inch and three quarters since being tagged. Right now, there's a St. Simons array under construction. And additional tagging will occur in both of these systems over the next two years. So this graph is kind of busy, but it shows something that's important. These are our gillnet CPUE, our longline CPUE, the MRIP estimated CPUE, and our car destinations all overlaid on the same graph. And what you can see is the trend for all of these surveys are relatively similar, which is a good thing we'll talk about in a little bit. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our 2017 Angler Satisfaction Survey. During 2017, CRD contracted with an independent research company, Responsive Management, to conduct a telephone and online survey of Georgia resident saltwater anglers and guides. The surveyed a random sampler of saltwater information permit holders, and it was open to all 134 state licensed saltwater resident guides. The emphasis of the survey was on red trum and spotted sea trout. We received responses from 1,965 recreational anglers from 124 counties across the state and 83 guides. 75% of red drum anglers were satisfied only 13% were dissatisfied with their red drum fishing in the past 12 months. Among guides, 73% were satisfied and 24% were dissatisfied. The survey determined that overall anglers release about half of their red drum catch. 23% of anglers released all or nearly all the red drum they caught, while 14% said they keep all that they catch. Guides indicated that their clients release legal red drum much more frequently than not. 72% of anglers are satisfied, while 16% are dissatisfied with the current regulations of five fish per day with a 14 to 23 inch slot limit. Conversely, red drum guides are more dissatisfied, 53% than satisfied, 44% with the regulations. As for alternative regulations, anglers most frequently selected a slot size of 14 to 25 inches, while guides most frequently chose 15 to 23 inches for a slot. 56% of anglers would like the creel limit to remain at five fish per person, with the second highest choice being six to 10 fish. Conversely, guides prefer a lower creel limit, and 51% of the guides prefer either a two or three fish limit with about a median of three. So now we'll move on to discussion. CRD surveys and MRIP data show similar trends in catch per unit effort. This agreement among surveys is a good thing because it suggests that there's a clear trend in the population that all the surveys are picking up on. There are no differences in northern and southern Georgia coastal trends. There doesn't appear to be localized effects due to higher effort in certain areas. All these trends are very similar and on the same scales as each other. Longline adult and juvenile net surveys show related trends but do not suggest a strong spawn or recruit trend. What you might expect is that the long line would have a strong year, and then the following year, the juvenile would have a strong year related to that previous um, adult year for the long line. This isn't the case. These two surveys are seeking up together. Um, 
So it's indicating that that there isn't a this spawn recruit relationship. Harvest size patterns show no change since the 1990s, despite changes in regulations and effort over time. What the stable harvest size proportions over time suggest is that the populations are stable, even though things are changing. You know this this trend has been the same, so the fish are still there and they're still getting harvested in the same way. Most harvested red drum are in the lower half of the slot. You know, this is an interesting thing, and it's probably related to fish availability in habitat, possibly numbers. Um, but based on preliminary tagging data and our coastal long lake survey, we see that fish are surviving and progressing on the slot. So these larger fish are still there in the upper half of the slot. They're just, for whatever reason, not showing up in harvest. But based on tagging, 45% of our legal size fish about 24% of the total of tags returned are being released after capture. And this 45% is similar to the 2017 survey results where anglers were saying that they were releasing on average around half the fish they're catching. So red drum populations in Georgia are stable over time with annual variability. This isn't unusual because it's the same pattern that's seen regionally in stock assessments. 2020 was a low year, but overall there were similarly low years in the past, such as 2012. So it's not necessarily unusual, it's not ideal. The long lifespan of red from allows populations to be resilient to these poor recruitment years. So because they live up to 50 years, it means that any one given poor year isn't necessarily going to affect the population as a whole and the spawning potential of the population. If you have a long succession of poor years, it's going to start to have an effect, but one year maybe even two years, isn't really going to uh, have much play in that overall health of the population. Something to think about is environmental regional, regional population dynamics may play a large role in red drum abundance in Georgia. Abundance seems to be somewhat cyclic. This could be based on some environmental pattern that we haven't picked, on yet, picked up on yet. The surveys show similar trends despite the sampling different aspects of the population. So as I said before, the longline survey that's that surveying adult fish is still seeing some of the same issues in a given year that juvenile surveys are. Something to think about too is our low year of 2012 up the coast of Virginia and Delaware, they had record high years for catch and landings that were just very unusual for them. What could be happening in the long term is that the population might be experiencing effects of long-term geographic shift with possible climate change you know, coming into play. So based on the available data, no management action for red drum is warranted at this time. Decline in numbers in 2020 might be a normal periodic event, such as seen in previous years like 2012. After those years, it's notable that there were rebounds in the population. However, it's still important to monitor and see if the downward trend continues or we do get a population rebound as in the past. Based on the 2017 Angler Satisfaction Survey, it's difficult to identify exact fishery management issues that might be ongoing in the stock. Because anglers and guides had divergent opinions, um, it's just difficult to see if there are any core issues going on. However, these attitudes may have changed over time in the past you know, four or five years since the Satisfaction Survey was performed. The results from the ongoing regional stock assessment will be important to help us provide information and what's going on in the population at the broader scale. So the ongoing Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission stock assessment will provide an update on the regional population status of red drum. This is a two-stage assessment. And the first step is developing a simulation model to select the best stock assessment model going forward based on the available data that we have. This is scheduled to be completed by next year. Following that, the second step will take that best model selected in step one and use it for a benchmark assessment, which is your typical assessment, and that's scheduled to be completed by 2024. The CRD data is being used in both steps of this assessment. Additionally, we'll continue to gather data through tagging and escapement programs. The longer time frames allow more data to be collected and our estimates to be improved. The greater time for tag fish to grow, disperse, and be reported by anglers or researchers. So hopefully, you know, we have five or six years of acoustic tag life for these fish to go out and roam and come back or you know, be detected. So we are planning a new angler satisfaction survey in 2022. And we're continuing to do our sampling versus via our field programs to monitor the population.
So now we'll take questions. My name is Jared Flowers. If you have questions after this meeting um, about the, either presentation or Red Drum Management in general, my email address is jaredflowers at dnr.ga.gov. And you can also call CRD, uh, the main line, and, and get me as well if you have questions. All right, thank you.